Okay, as we said on uh, Sunday, we're beginning a new series um, this evening of our discipleship classes. Um, it comes really out of um, our strategic plan. Uh, you may remember that one of the uh, pillars of our strategic plan includes the whole idea of our worship and service of the Lord and how we can enhance that as a fellowship. And one thing that we have been slowly working away at, a lot of this behind the scenes, is to prepare the ground for expanding the, the hymns and songs that we have available to us to use in public worship. Um, Cassia in particular has done an um, amazing amount of work, probably getting over 200 new hymns into a place where they can be uh, either put out onto handouts or put up onto the screen here and uh, beginning to work towards some kind of way to catalog them and index them so that it'll be easier for Pastor Bryant to find hymns that are pertinent to uh, the particular topic that uh, he's looking for. Uh, but the whole project took a huge leap forward <clears throat> probably about uh, three months ago when uh, we accomplished something that was in our budget for last year, but we couldn't get around to it then, and that was to actually put the projector up here and the screen, which will um, enable us to be able to sing uh, items that are not in our hymn books without having to produce handouts that then get either littered about the place or uh, thrown away. Um, so since now all of these components have come together, it's a good time to begin to take a look at some new hymns and to introduce them so that we can begin to use them as the opportunity arises um, on the Lord's Day. Uh, what I want to do tonight is to introduce one of those hymns. Some of you may have already had some exposure to it from the email that I sent out earlier in the week. Uh, but before we get to the hymn, I just want to cover some ground on um, the basics of sung worship. This is a, a study that we did 12 or 13 years ago, believe it or not, that is up on our website, um, Biblical Worship. And uh, one of those has to do with sung worship. We've called this series uh, Sing to Him a New Song. I'm going to have to move fairly quickly to get through this in time. So. Um, Fasten your seatbelts, and let's get started. Here's what we're trying to do then. We're going to have a reminder of um, sung worship and how important it is. And then we're going to seek to enhance our worship by extending our repertoire of hymns now that we have uh, the apparatus that enables us to do that more easily. Um, a biblical basis for singing. And as I said, this comes from our website. We're going to look at, shall we sing? Is that an appropriate thing to do? We believe in the regulative principle that we should not invent things to do in worship. We should really only do things that we have warrant in Scripture to do. Do we have that warrant uh, in the case of singing? Uh, if we do, then what shall we sing? And how shall we sing it? And how is this worship anyway? And then we'll get to our first hymn, which Donna has been practicing furiously for um, a few weeks now. Well, maybe not furiously. Uh, I think in a good spirit. But um. Okay. Shall we sing? The answer, of course, is yes. Um, and it's yes because we've got commands. Here is a command. Anybody see the command picked out in that verse? Everybody agree that that is a command to us as a New Testament fellowship to sing uh, and make melody in our hearts to the Lord. Okay. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. 
Here's another one, a parallel passage out of Colossians. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. I don't know how often you think about this when we stand to sing a hymn. We are actually teaching and admonishing one another using the words of those hymns. Um, It's an act of of corporate instruction and uh, admonition. Um, Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? Anyone cheerful tonight? Uh Uh-oh. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, at least a few people. Well, then you are to sing praises. That's what it says. And uh, so we've got commands, and I'm sure there are others that you would be able to find if, if you looked carefully enough. Uh, but we also have examples. Uh, the first one, of course, is from the Lord Jesus himself. Um, at the end of um, the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, After singing a hymn, uh, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And, um, of course, Paul and Silas set us a wonderful example uh, on their missionary journey when they are over in Philippi and they are uh, beaten and uh, thrown into the inner prison by the jailer who'd been given instructions about them. And their feet were fastened in the stocks. And uh, they were in a miserable condition. And they spent the whole night grumbling and saying, well, I hadn't thought this was what the missionary life was all about. Um, No, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Can anybody think of any other examples that we might call to mind. Um, I suspect there would be some. Yes, Sarah. Well, I think that's like hearing a bunch of women exalted and dancing to Jesus' Miriam? Yeah, I think that is correct. Um, there are other examples. Did you have one, Kathy? Yeah, we'll, we'll see. There are actually what, what are believed to be sections of New Testament um, songs or hymns included in some of the letters for us. So if you do that study sometime, it could be interesting just to explore how interwoven into the worship of the people of God uh, singing has been. Is there a book that you might turn to to learn the kind of things that uh, the Church of God has sung historically, that we might have just read 75 of. (laughs) What could that be? Psalms, yeah, those are worship songs that were written to be used in sung worship of God. Okay, so now what shall we sing? And this is a little bit controversial, but... Um, in order to fuel the controversy, I intend to come down fairly strongly on one particular side of the argument. But there are those who say, well, we've got the Psalms, and there is no warrant for us to go um, beyond Psalms in our sung worship. And um, let me say, that is a position I can totally respect. It's not one that I personally agree with, but neither is it one over which... um, believers should divide. But let me just present why I think uh, there is scope given to us in Scripture to go beyond the Psalms in the things that we sing in worship. Uh, And if I don't make a very good case, then um, the Sunday service could get changed quite significantly, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, So those verses that we looked at in Ephesians and Colossians, um, they contain three words, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, which if you go back to the Greek, psalmos, hymnos, and ode. 
the leading idea of Salmos is something that has a, a, a musical accompaniment. Um, the leading idea of Humnos is of praise to God. And the word Ode is used of a song in general, whether or not it's accompanied, whether or not it is a song of praise or of any other subject. Um, so that it's quite possible to use... Um, oh, I've got a fly crawling across the screen. Um, that the same song could be described by all three of those um, words. Psalm, a, a song could be a psalm and a hymn and an ode, if you like. Um, but it does seem to imply that there are three categories intended here. Um, otherwise, you have Paul writing uh, to the Ephesians and the Colossians saying, sing make new, new, um, psalms, more psalms, and even more psalms to each other. Um, that's an interesting concept. But here's another reason which I think is very powerful, because Revelation had reached a certain point at the time that the Psalms were written. And uh, the fulfillment of all that was being prophesied in terms of the coming of Christ just was not there, including even his name, Jesus Christ. So we could never take the name Jesus Christ onto our lips in praise of our Savior if we'd have to understand when we came across the anointed or uh, some other reference to him that uh, that is what was intended. Um, so I think that's quite an interesting argument. Um, but then you have supplementary arguments like this. No less than six of the Psalms, 33, 40, 96, 98, 144, 149, contain the injunction to sing a new song. So now you're singing a psalm that says, sing a new song. Uh, and you find it again in Isaiah 42. Commands to the people of God to sing a new song. And in fact, that's exactly what you find the people of God doing in the Revelation, the book of Revelation. In chapter 5 and verse 9, in chapter 14 and verse 3, and they sang a new song to the Lord. And the words that they are actually recorded as singing are not from the Psalms. Uh, so then how could that be consistent with an approach in which you restrict yourself to singing only Psalms? And then, as Kathy just pointed out, there are what are believed to be, I think quite generally believed, to be examples of songs uh, incorporated into the New Testament scriptures. Um, you may want to look these up. I'll, we'll find a way of posting this uh, presentation afterwards for those who are hastily scribbling. Uh, but you'll find them in Ephesians 5, 13 and 14. Philippians uh, 2, 5 to 11, 1 Timothy 3, 16, uh, 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 13. And you'll see that many Bibles actually lay them out as in a versified form. Um, the mystery of godliness is great. He was, you know, and so, and so on it goes. Um, and it's believed that those are structured as the songs of that time, and they're laid out that way for us to help us understand that um, in the scriptures. So if you take all of those things and put them together, um, that is why I am satisfied in my own mind that it is appropriate and uh, indeed quite necessary for us to go beyond the wonderful content that we do have in the Psalms. We're not setting the Psalms on one side here, um, not at all. Um, but we certainly have warrant, I think, to go further in our sung worship. Now, anybody have any questions or comments about that so far? Are we all fairly content that we're doing 
an acceptable thing when we sing a hymn that you can't find in, in the Psalms. Um, and that, it's, it's important to deal with that and just to make sure, because we will meet people, uh, godly people, who are convinced in their own hearts that, uh, that the Psalms are the, the vehicle that we should use in our song worship um, today. Well, now, how shall we sing? We've established that, uh, that it's right to sing and that we should go beyond the Psalms. How shall we sing? And uh, in the beginning of the uh, old version of Christian hymns that we used to use uh, in the UK, um, they have recorded and, and repeated some instructions that John Wesley wrote for his congregation when uh, they came to sing. Um, so let's take a look at this. Uh, first instruction, learn these tunes before you learn any others. The tunes of the hymns you're going to sing. Excuse me. Afterwards, learn as many as you please, but learn these ones first. Uh, sing them exactly as they are printed without altering or mending them at all. And if you learned to sing them otherwise, unlearn it as soon as you can. <laughs> and it's interesting that we do learn, there are hymns that we sing that we collectively have decided to sing wrongly. Now, as long as we're all in on that deal, that's okay. Um, and uh, the, pi the pianist will often adapt to the fact that we're not singing it correctly and make sure that there's no kind of uh, competition going on between the piano and the congregation. Sometimes we'll, s we'll put an extra note in, or sometimes we'll, we'll miss when the, the, the tune goes up and comes down again, or, or something like that. Could be both, couldn't it? Um, and it's also true that sometimes we get, the, we get the wrong words impressed in our mind. We assume something about uh, the words. When, when we get to a certain hymn that, uh, that I'm going to introduce, won't be tonight, um, I, I'll give you an example of how somebody got completely the wrong word in introducing a hymn. And once you hear it, you'll never be able to look at that hymn again without thinking about the wrong word, um, but hopefully not singing it. Sing all. Now, it took me a while to figure out here that I think he's not saying sing all the verses. I think he's saying every one of you sing. We don't want some people sort of saying, oh, I'm not going to bother with this. Or others saying, well, it's, it's not for me. See that you join with the congregation as frequently as you can. Let not a slight degree of weakness or weariness hinder you. Um, be together with God's people when they are going to sing praise and worship to the Lord. If it's a cross to you, or go home and watch TV. Oh, no. <laughs> Didn't have TV back then. Um, take up that cross, and you will find it a blessing. Uh, here's one that we might need to interpret for today's audience. Sing lustily and with a good courage. Have you ever summoned your courage when you open the hymn book? Um, he is saying that we've got to have life and uh, purpose in our singing. Beware of singing as if you were half dead or half asleep, especially if that half begins here and goes up, um, which sometimes you have. I'll, I'll tell you this story. Uh, it's quite funny, but it's, it's a good story. It was our pastor um, in a church in England. Uh, I've told Pastor Bryant this story. Um, he had a pulpit which was very, very high, and the organist was buried somewhere behind it, out of sight of the congregation. And that would be nice. <laughs> right. Um, and, and Selwyn, the pastor, I think it was uh, he that did it, he actually wired 
a switch in his pulpit and wires down to a red light in front of the organist when the organist was playing. The organist had wing mirrors so that he could see when the offering had been taken up, and it was a bit of a silly arrangement, I think, but anyway. So Selwyn had this button, and more than once in the, in the years that we were there, we would begin a hymn, and if Selwyn believed that we were not that we were singing like we were half dead or half asleep. He would press the button, light would come on in front of the organist, the organist would stop. And Selwyn would say, and you, you didn't want to hear this, but he would say, this is a glorious hymn. And we are not going to sing it as a dirge. We'll start again. And he was absolutely right. We shouldn't sing praise to our God with half our mind, half our heart, being half dead or half asleep. Lift up your voice with strength. Be no more afraid of your voice now, nor more ashamed of its being heard than when you sung the songs of Satan. Uh, before we were saved, we would put a lot of effort into singing the songs of the world. Um, and shame on us if we put less effort into singing uh, glorious hymns in praise of our God and our Savior. Sing modestly. Do not bawl so as to be heard above or distinct from the rest of the congregation, that you may not destroy harmony, but strive to unite your voices together so as to make one clear, melodious sound. Sing in time. Whatever time is sung, be sure to keep with it. Do not run before, nor stay behind it, but attend close to the leading voices and move therewith as exactly as you can, and take care not to sing too slow. Um, that tends to move you towards a dirge when the tempo drops way down. For a start, it becomes hard to take enough air into your lungs to get through a line where you should get all the way through it without breathing, and you're sort of expiring three quarters of the way through. Um, but yes, um, it's good to have a, a good tempo for the hymn and to stay in time with it. And I think this is the last one and the most important one. Above all, sing spiritually. Have an eye to God in every word you sing. Aim at pleasing Him more than yourself or any other creature. In order to do this, and this is critical, attend strictly to the sense of what you sing and see that your heart is not carried away with the sound, but offered to God continually. If you are in a congregation of people who are singing their hearts out, you can get carried away with the occasion. And the tune could be a wonderful tune. And it will produce an emotional response, but that's not necessarily a spiritual response. There's nothing wrong with emotion in singing. But if that's all you have, um, then you've got a problem. So I've got some answers up on here, but your turn now. How is it worship to sing as we have been describing so far? Okay, it's declaring the worth of our God. Maria, you... Yeah. Thanking God and being grateful to Him for His love and His mercy. Donna. Right. It, yeah, it, it helps because that's how the Lord has made us. 
We don't want just emotionalism. But if your Christianity and mine has no emotion in it, then I'm sorry, but that's not what the Bible says Christianity is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a felt religion. If you can be taken from death to life and not know or feel anything about it, that's rather strange, isn't it? Ascribe to God his worth. Yes. Praising, honoring him, thanking him. Expressing our love and adoration. Sometimes, and not infrequently, the hymn writer manages to express exactly the thing that you'd love to, to have thought in order to say it to the Lord, to, to praise him and thank him. But we're not that good at putting thoughts together like that. And um, another thing, most, many, if not all, no, many, if not most, of the really great hymns were written in times of revival when the Holy Spirit was working mightily in the hearts of God's people and gifting them to be able to distill down these glorious truths into just a few lines. And um, that's, just praise God that he does that. And it's evident in, in many of these hymns. Uh, <clears throat> and it's worship when our hearts and our minds and our lips are all in sync so that the Lord doesn't look at us and just see words coming out but nothing, just an empty void where, where they're supposed to be coming from. Um, and the, something else going on up here instead of us, as Wesley said, sort of taking on board what we're singing about and paying close attention uh, to the meaning. Okay, I think we're ready to start getting into the first hymn. Um, <clears throat> it's a wonderful hymn. Uh, and I think if you read the email that I sent around earlier in the week, you'll have seen that it was called uh, The Love Song of the Welsh Revival in 1904. Um, you can read about that revival, particularly if you go and Google um, a character called Ivian Evans, which is spelled E-I-F-I-O-N, Ivian Evans, E-V-A-N-S, and Welsh Revival. There's a section on the 1904 revival. You'll see that it was in a very short space of time, the Lord converted probably in excess of 150,000 people in Wales, the whole nation of Wales. It spread beyond the boundary into England. It went down to Australia. It came across to the States somewhat. I don't think it was one of the greater revivals, although it was clearly great. The courts were out of business. The law officers had nothing to do except to marshal the people in and out of the prayer meetings um, of the chapels and so on. And as with all true revivals, there was a mixture of counterfeit and weird and wonderful stuff, well, not so wonderful, stuff going on at the same time. And trying to sift your way through that becomes a little bit complicated. And we have an enemy who will always try and counterfeit the genuine um, in order to deceive people. Um, but this hymn was written by a character called William Rees, uh, born there in 1802 in a farmhouse with a name that I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce. Pam might be able to have a better go at it. Sorry? Quibrenisaf. Quibrenisaf. There you are. That's how to say that. At the foot of Munnedd uh, Hiraithog in Llansanen Parish, Denbyshire in Wales. Um, dying 81 years later in Chester in England. He was a minister ministered um, in the Liverpool area, um, and you can see that he's buried there in Toxteth, um, Liverpool. And um, he, I think in keeping with many people in his day, seemed to be very much socially involved. He edited a newspaper for some time, had some political um, activity. But by the accounts that I read, at least, his... Uh, celebrations of the Lord's Supper were very rich and special times. And 
Um, certainly you could imagine the hymn that he's best known for. Uh, Here is love, vast as the ocean, the Welsh is there, Damagariad Vela um, Moroid, is, is a wonderful uh, hymn to sing on an occasion like that. And uh, it was sung many, many, many times during that 1904 revival. And um, that's why it became, it was almost the theme song, the love song of the Welsh revival. Um, you can imagine uh, the coal miners who had their pit ponies. The pit ponies responded to the cursing and, and foul commands that were shouted at them and, and so on by these godless miners. And then the revival came. And the pit ponies didn't know what to do because <laughs> now they're being commanded or asked to do things with kindness and uh, by co completely transformed men. Uh, but the productivity in the mines went up and the, the tendency for the miners just to spend their wages down at the pubs and uh, their families to, to, to be deprived. That all went away. The society was just transformed. You can al almost imagine the mines echoing with people singing Dama Gariad Vel Amoroid. Here is love, vast as the ocean. There's only two verses to the hymn. You will find some versions that have an extra two, which are thought to have been added by William Williams. Um, if you look, the, to me, there is a huge transition from the the, f the original two verses to the second two, the whole direction of the hymn seems to change, and it's more than I can cope with, because these first two verses are all about Christ. It's all praise and adoration and worship of him. And then suddenly it turns to me, and I, I'd rather stay with Christ. Too. There are hymns that we can sing about ourselves, but um, uh, these first two verses are all uh, just admiration of Christ. Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood, when the Prince of Life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. Who his love will not remember? Who can cease to sing his praise? Can never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal days. So what is the event when the hymn writer says, here is love? What's he thinking about? The crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. You want to know what love is? Look here. You think of a scripture that talks about the cross in, in those terms as the demonstration of the love of God for fallen and undeserving sinners. How about that one? While we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, for one will hardly die for a righteous man. Though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. By the way, this is something I quite like to do. Very often when a hymn writer is writing a hymn, they'll have scriptures in mind and they'll allude to things in scripture. And I like to try and see, well, where could this have come from or, or whatever. Um, what's a ransom? Sorry? A payment. And what does that payment do? A payment for somebody to go free. Yeah, if somebody's been kidnapped, they'll demand a ransom. Um, why was a ransom necessary in our case? 
because we were held captive to Satan and a price had to be paid, the price of our debt to the law and the, the justice of God. There's a reverse that speaks about our redemption, which is our, our ransom, um, by the precious blood of Christ. Yeah, Second Peter, I think you're... No, oh, First Peter, there you go. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Okay, second verse. On the Mount of Crucifixion, now we come to it. Fountains opened, deep and wide. Through the floodgates of God's mercy flowed a vast and gracious tide. Grace and love like mighty rivers poured incessant from above. And heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world in love. Is there a scripture that talks about fountains opening? Well, it turns out that there is in Zechariah. In that day a fountain will be opened for the house of David, David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for impurity. What would a fountain do? Wash. Is there a scripture that talks about um, peace and righteousness or justice kissing one another? Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Loving kindness and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. You think about the, there was warfare between us and God. God's righteousness was offended. His justice needed to be satisfied. And here, how, how can you have righteousness and peace kissing each other in the case of defiled, vile sinners? Well, only if you find a ransom, someone who can pay the price uh, for our cleansing and redeem us. Okay, let's very quickly... Um, I probably need to do this, do I? Oh, it's not coming up, is it? Okay, we'll skip over this because we're short of time anyway. I was Did you get to see that video that I sent around in the email earlier in the week? which had uh, somebody on the, on the centenary of the... Oh, right, that's not going to work. On the centenary of the uh, actual... Um, revival, the 1904 revival, um, they had a, a celebration. Let's see if this will work. Uh, okay. Have we got some sound? This will give you the tune. Sixty miles down the road.
Okay, so hopefully that gives you an idea of uh, the tune. So now it's our turn, if Donna would come up. We all have to sing it at least as well as that, okay? <laughs> You can you could do it all in Welsh if you prefer. That's <laughs> that's um, maybe let's hear what it, a verse sounds like on the piano, um, and then we'll stand and sing the hymn through together, and then we'll close in prayer. Okay. It's a great hymn, and it really <clears throat> is an encouragement to me to sing it again after all these years. But uh, let's close in prayer, and then we can turn to our prayer meeting. Let's pray together.